today we are going to have some kind of a tutorial discussion where I will analyze the problems of quiz one. As far as the quiz is concerned, the emphasis was testing your understanding of the control structures and the program execution. The last problem actually was a synthesis problem where you have to write a full program. I'll quickly analyze these problems. Most of you should have got the right answers. The first question was very simple. It was to test whether you can follow the uh, instructions of the algorithm and execute them correctly. Temp is a artificial variable. This value 161 has absolutely no bearing on the algorithm as we shall see. It says first and second defines a thing called result, defines integer i and r and it asks you to give a number which is last two digits of your roll number. This is merely to ensure that everybody executes the algorithm with a different input. To begin with, you are supposed to execute this iteration which varies i from 0 to 5 and it multiplies the value of temp incrementally by i. So, originally this is the value you start with when you enter this iteration. However, as i varies from 0, 1, 2, 3 and 4, the value of temp increasingly takes what value? The first time i is 0, so when you multiply temp with 0, you actually get a 0. And then it does not matter what you multiply it with, it remains 0. This is just for you to figure out that this iteration leaves temp as 0 and it has no impact on anything else that happens subsequently. The input value r which you have given, let us assume r as some number. Let us assume r as 34. So I have roll number, let us say, which ends in last two digits, 34. Now after this temp, you will agree that when I say r is equal to r plus temp, r remains unchanged. So if I have read r as 34, r still remains 34. Now when I calculate first, what will be the value of first? The first is r by 10. It's an integer division. 34 divided by 10, I will get 3. The value of second, the instruction says r modulus 10. So that is a remainder after dividing it by 10, which means I will get the last digit of whatever number I have given, in this case it will be 4. And if you notice when I calculate the result, I multiply 4 by 10 and add first which is 3 and then add 1 for good measure. So effectively this will give me 43 which is actually the inverted last two digits of your roll number. I add 1 to it and the result should be 44. So everybody got it? No, everybody didn't get it. Somebody perhaps made a mistake in calculating temp as 0 and some got some very funny numbers. But this is where you need to be very careful about both what you write and when you read what somebody else has written, how to understand and analyze that program. Let's go back to the next question. So these were the answers. The input will be last two digits of your roll number. The value of temp at the end will be zero actually. And the result will be whatever. I am thinking of suggesting to my TAs that it is possible that you have goofed up in calculating temp. In which case, if you have done this part correctly, I will ask my TAs to consider giving partial credit for this. That will of course be held in evaluation because everybody would have a different value of temp and then adding it and then finding out whatever, whatever is not going to be very straightforward. 
but I will see about that. However, there is absolutely no reason why anybody should goof up on this. The only way you can goof up is do not execute your instructions manually by writing down variable names, writing down values bef below the variable names in the rough sheet and going step by step on each iteration, finding out what happens next. Question two is slightly more tricky. It has an array of five elements where A0 is one, A1 is one, A2 is one, and A3 is one. So all elements are initialized to one except the last one. The last one is expected as input from you and you are supposed to give the value of A4, the last element. After this, you enter into this computation. This is essentially a triple nested iteration. The outer iteration varies I from 0 to 5. The inner iteration next to it varies J from 0 to I minus 1. And the innermost iteration varies K, a third index, which varies from 0 to J minus 1. I, J and K are incremented by 1 each. So seemingly very simple algorithm, it just this addition, S is equal to S plus AI plus AJ plus AK. Notice that what it is doing is merely adding some three elements of the array A, which has actually five elements, choosing different combinations at different times, depending upon the values of I, J and K, which are decided by this loop. A1, A2, A3, A4 are constant values 1. A5 is a value that you given. The question asked was that if I give the value 1, if I give the value 2, if I give the value 3, if I give the value 4, do I get a sum which was I think 42, right? Okay. This problem can also be solved working out exactly the same way that you did in the earlier problem namely executing this algorithm. Of course, this involves a lot of ghodagiri just for us to realize what amount of work that Dumbo is doing whenever we give instructions of this kind. However, we must be able to interpret Dumbo's actions correctly and therefore, it is important that you understand what will happen when I finally print out this sum. I leave this detailed exercise to you, but those of you who did not get the answer right, I would urge them to once again try it on paper. You don't need a computer to work this out. But this kind of practice must be ingrained into your mind to automatically look at what happens to different values when complex computations are done. And the right answer was three. How many of you got it? Oh, large number. But still some didn't get it. Perhaps the mistake would be in some simple arithmetic or index uh, range or some such thing. These two problems were really simple according to me. The third problem is also simple, but it requires some thinking. Here, we give some start time and a duration, and you are supposed to write a program which will add the duration to start time, giving you the end time. The main program was like this, where I read the start time from you, where I read the duration from you. And then I calculate a function which says calculate end time with two parameters, start time, duration. So with these two parameters which I have just read in here, the control will go to the calculate end time function which will calculate some result and when the result is returned back here, the result will replace this whole function call and that is what will be assigned here. So to go back to the previous slide, this is where you are supposed to, this is the function calculate end time. You are supposed to write your code here, which will add start time and duration, and it will return R. Let's look at some examples to see what we will do here. So let us take an example. Let us take time as 14 45. This actually is equivalent to 2 I hope
hope this is clearly understood. 14, 45 means it is beyond 12. So 14 minus 12 is 2. So it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon and 45 minutes. Suppose I give a duration which is 1 hour 10 minutes. Then if I add these two, I can simply add the minutes to minutes. I will get 55 minutes and 14 hours to 1 hour, I will get 1555, which is actually equal to 3.55 p.m. This is no complication. One can understand it easily. But if one concludes that, therefore, if I add duration to start time, it is adequate, that is not correct. Why? Let us take another example where I add 14.45, which is the start time, to a duration, which is, let us say, 23.30. This time is 2.45 p.m. as usual and this duration 23.30 means I am adding 23 hours and 30 minutes. That is the duration. So if I am today at 2.45 p.m., clearly I will be there somewhere tomorrow, maybe early afternoon. It is almost 24 hours later. So I will be almost 2.45 p.m., 30 minutes less. So the correct answer finally should be 2 Is that correct? If today 2.45 p.m. I add 23 hours 30 minutes, this is the time I should get. You will agree that if I simply add these two up, I will not get this answer. So the correct thing is, from the given number, from the given four-digit number, you have to first discern hours and minutes separately, both for the duration and for the start time. Then you should add only the minutes part. Here you will get 75 minutes. Clearly there is no clock time which has 75 minutes. So when you get 75 minutes, you should subtract 60 from it. You will get the time as 15 minutes and plus one hour. Because 75 minutes is one hour 15 minutes. So you reduce this by 60, you will get 15 minutes. That will be the result minutes here. As far as hours are concerned, I will now have to add these hours, 23, which is the duration, to the original hours, 14, plus this carried forward one hour, which I got from here, and finally I will get this as 24, uh, plus 23, plus 1, plus 14, 38. Now, this 38 is beyond 24. So obviously I am talking about tomorrow. But what time? So I should subtract 24 from this to get 14. Consequently, the final answer should be 1415, which in our conventional time sense happens to be 250. Is this clear? So how many of you got this? Oh, still a good number, but not as many as the previous one. So this kind of tricky problems, you will find many. A typical calendar problem falls into this class. So what is the date? If you, if you are told 1st January 2009 was a certain day, whatever Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, then what, was the, what will be the day on 5th November 2009. Now that is a tricky question because it involves arithmetic, which is different month-wise, because there are some months with 31 days, some months with 30 days, so it's not very easy. In this particular case, this is a program that I have written. I will be putting up this program on the website, so you can copy it from there. This is just to understand that when I read my start time and end time, I define intermediate variables, hour start, minute start, hours for duration, minutes for duration, and hours end, minutes end. 
the way I handle this is I calculate hour start by dividing S by 100 and minute start I get by finding out S modulo 100. You will agree that like in the first question, I will get last two digits by, by doing this and the first two digits by doing this which are respectively hours and minutes. I print those things out. Similarly, I dissect the duration into hours and minutes. Using exactly the same formulation, I print it out. So far, so good. By this, what I will do is I will get this breakup. I will get 14 hours and 45 minutes and I, for start time and I will get 23 hours and 30 minutes for duration. Now I find final minutes by simply adding the minutes of start time and minutes of duration. However, as we saw earlier, if the total is greater than 60, then obviously I have got one hour and some minutes. So I will reduce the minutes by 60 and add one to HD, which was the duration hour. So whatever is the duration hours, I need to get one more hour added to it in case the minutes are greater than 60. After coming out, I will find out the hours of end point, which is hours start point plus hours of duration, which might have been modified here. I am putting a printout here to say end minutes are ME and end hour are HE. Will that be the correct result? No. Well, some cases, yes, end minutes will be correct, but end hour may be a value greater than 24. So consequently, I have to do one more check. If hours at end are greater than 24, I have to reduce those hours to less than 24. That is what will get me the final hours. And to compose the four-digit number, I do the reverse of the dissection that I did earlier. I multiply HE by 100 and add ME to it. I get the result value, which I return. Yes. Very good point. What he is suggesting is that if I test the condition which I had tested here, ME greater than 60, then only if the minutes are 61, 62 or 100 or whatever, they will get converted correctly. However, if the start time was some hours 40 minutes and duration was some hours 20 minutes, then the total I will get will be 60. 60 also should be reduced to zero. So the correct condition is not ME greater than 60, but ME greater than 59. Because even at 60, I must subtract 60, make it zero, zero. Wonderful. What's your name, young man? Nikhil, let's give a good hand to Nikhil. Good, good problem solved. Here are some execution results for Q3V1. I compile as usual and execute it. I have given start time as 15.30, duration as 23.45. This is dissected and the output says stars hours are 15 minutes 30, duration hours are 23 minutes 45. The end minutes are calculated as 15. The end hour is calculated as 39, which is then reduced subsequently to get end time as 15.15. Observe that this program works correctly merely because the minutes total of start minutes and duration minutes are not adding to exact 60. If they did, the output produced will be wrong. Yes, that's right. So you need an additional instruction along with finding modulo remainder to actually get the number of hours. That's also correct. And the reason for the hours addition, again, has to be modulo computing because the number of hours, we are presuming that the duration will be less than 24. That assumption is correct because that is what is stated. The duration is given in a 24-hour format. A 24-hour format cannot contain a duration which is more than 24 hours. But technically, I could have to solve a problem where I have to add 72 hours or 52 hours to the start time with some minutes, in which case it will not be adequate to just reduce 24 from the sum of hours. Good points, all of you. Sir, I, yeah. So this problem can be solved if instead of subtracting 24, you divide by 24 and take the remainder. Well, uh, roughly the same thing as finding out modulo remainder and finding out how many hours are extra. That is correct. 
The problem is, if the duration is stated to be much more than 24 hours, say 72 hours or something, you will get the value correctly, but you won't know whether it is tomorrow or day after or day after, unless you print the number of days as an additional output. Of course, it was not intended to test those things here. What was intended was to test whether you can correctly conclude that the minutes have to be less than 60 and hours have to be less than 24. That was the limited expectation from this problem. But I'm glad that this discussion has thrown up additional possibilities. This is not a very difficult question, but certainly a question which requires you to think. Actually, the question that has been put here by my TAs in a very simple form, but it represents an extremely complex branch of algorithms which is called dynamic programming. Some of you who subsequently specialize in study of algorithms will actually come across these problems. Very interesting and complex problems which require a different approach to solution called dynamic programming. We will not go into those details now. I shall subsequently suggest to you which are some of the large and complex problems towards which we are trying to lead by solving such uh, uh, examples. So in this example, there is an array of integers given and there is a sequence of numbers. The example given was 1, 4, 1, 6, 5, 1, 7, 8, 12. Now, any subsequence of this is any continuous set of elements. So for example, 1, 4, these are the first two elements. 1, 4, 1, they are the first three elements. 6, 5, 1, 7, these are the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh element. So any contiguous elements will be a subset, will be a subsequence. There are obviously very large number of sub such subsequences depending upon the number of elements that you have in the array. If the array has n elements, the number of subsequences will be of what order? Can you guess? Will there be n subsequences if there are n numbers? Obviously not. Just consider each element as an independent subsequence. You get n subsequences by just considering one element each. So consider two elements each. One, two, two, three, three, four. One, two, one, three, one, sorry. He is saying n into n minus one by two. That is roughly the sum of n integer numbers. And clearly the number of subsequences that you will have will be much larger. It is a suggestion I make. Please examine whether the order of magnitude of such number of subsequences does not turn out to be factorial. But I will leave it at that. What problem we are solving specifically is much simpler. We are not interested in listing all subsequences. Although, in order to solve this problem, you will have to traverse through each and every of such subsequent. Because the question is that I want to find out those subsequences which add up to a given value. 10, 15, 23, 2000, whatever. For example, this subsequence, 1, 4, adds up to 5. This adds up to 6. This adds up to 6 plus 5. 11 plus 1, 12 plus 7, 19. Each subsequence sums up to some value. The question relates to finding out which are those subsequences which add up to a given value. Obviously, you can't determine that unless you go through each and every subsequence, whether it is of the magnitude factorial or whatever. Now, how do we do that? We first find out a simple method of representing a subsequence. After all, if n is say 5,000, then subsequences will be very large. Representing them would be tough. So we say that every subsequence is represented by the first index value and the last index value. So for example, if this is the subsequence, then the third element is 6. Uh, sorry, this is 0th element, first element, second element, third element. So if I am looking at the subsequence 6, 5, 1, 7, I know it starts here. Now this element is 0, 1, 2, 3, third element. And it ends here. Now this element is 3, 4, 5, 6, sixth element. So consequently, if I say 3, 6, 
then this represents a subsequence which starts at the third element and ends at the sixth element. Third and sixth being stated with reference to zero being the first element. Consequently, I can represent all my subsequences like that. If there is a subsequence of a single element, the start and end point will be same. The question was that while the sum of the numbers in each such sub subsequence will ordinarily add up to some arbitrary value, here what we want is that you read an array A of integers, consider only positive numbers and a number R which is an integer as input and find all continuous subsequences in the form start index and end index which add up to the number R. So you have to find out a subset, subset of those subsequences which add up to the given value R. For each such subsequence, the program should output the start index and the end index, that is the pair on one line. And after listing all such subsequences, your program should end. In case there is no such subsequence which adds up to given value, say uh, 15, 10, whatever, then your output should be a message saying no such subsequence adding up to the given value found, whatever. So this is the program. This was the example given. In this example, there were four subsequences which were adding up to value 12. And therefore, your output should have been 0, 3, 2, 4, 3, 5, 8, 8. Why 8, 8? Let's go back. 8, 8 is the last element 12, which alone adds up to 12. So the subsequence is starting point this, ending point this, which is the earth element. I hope at least the problem was understood by everybody. Good. The solution is not very difficult. I have tried to write. There are actually three versions which I will be putting up on the on the uh, uh, web page for you to look at. This is a version where I have used an outer iteration using an index i, which goes from the first element of the array to the last element, and then inside. I use a while loop to traverse for the subsequent positions of the array starting from the first position to find out whether there is a subsequence which adds up to the given value. Now while I add up, I might exceed the sum in which case I terminate my search. There is no point in searching further because additional numbers will only increase the sum. If I ex extend beyond that array, I again stop and go to the next starting point because there is nothing more to search. But if at any point in my search, within the second iteration, if the sum adds up to the given value, then I know I have hit upon a subsequence. I know the starting point where I started. Wherever I am currently, I will term it as end point and print the start point and end point. Having done that, I cannot have any other subsequence adding up to that given value starting with the same index. And therefore, I break out of the iteration and I go back to the next starting point. This is just a part of the program which reads the data. Then it reads the given value, an integer value. I want to find out whether the sum adds up to this given value. So this is the iteration. I do not know whether I will find any subsequence or not. So what I do is, I set up the, I, I have two indices which are defined here. Let's go back to the previous, uh, this thing. I have defined here SI, EI, and SUM. SI is the start index, EI is the end index, and SUM is the running SUM that I will calculate. Since, as I said, I do not know whether I will ever get a single subsequence adding up to given value, I start my iteration with EI set to minus 1. This minus 1 is arbitrary, but this is some value which I will never get as sum. Any negative value will do therefore. Observe that 0 will not do because the entire array, if it contains 0, all sums will add to 0. So it has to be a negative. And this minus 1 is justified because the problem says that I have to consider an array of only positive integers. If you have to consider an array of negative and positive integers, you will have to have some other mechanism 
like setting up a flag, which will be false initially, and only if you find at least one subsequence, you will set that flag to true or something. So that is another mechanism that you can use. In here, as I told you, I am setting up a simple iteration at the beginning for i equal to 0 to n minus 1. And this shall always be my starting point of the subsequence to search. So I am therefore setting si equal to 1. Since I am looking at a new subsequence, I start with sum equal to 0. And I have to start summing up from this element itself onwards. Because remember, only one element can add up to that sum. So I will set the starting point for inner iteration to SI itself. Now what I do in the second iteration? I check whether J is less than L. So along the array, I have to go from the start point to the end point. Start point is shifting. Whatever is the start point from there up to N minus 1, I have to keep adding sum. And how long I have to keep adding it? As long as the sum is less than given value. Observe that if I have 1,000 elements and sum exceeds the given value on say fifth element, there is no point in going further because sum will only increase. So this is the condition for ending iteration. Either j should be less than n or the sum should be less than given value. Then and only then I am interested in examining subsequent elements of that uh, subsequence to find out whether I get the sum. I add aj to sum. I started with sum equal to 0, the first element itself is added here, yeah, sorry, I know that many of you are very keen to comment on many interesting and useful modifications that can be done. Unfortunately, in this class where we have to end in exactly 5 minutes, I am unable to take these suggestions, but I have a suggestion. I got some very interesting feedback on Moodle from students who have tried variations. I will encourage all of you to upload such suggestions on the Moodle. It is not necessary that you write complete programs and upload them, but even if you have such suggestion, as long as you have thought through those suggestions, do make those suggestions. I will ask my TAs to compile all of them and connect them to appropriate problem which is being discussed. I hope that material will be useful to all of you. So we will take additional suggestions later. This is just, I would say, one way of solving this problem. What I am doing is, while j is less than n and sum is less than given value, I am simply adding each element to sum. Notice this slash slash c out less less indices are i, j, sum. What is the purpose? Slash slash means clearly this is a comment. The importance of such lines is that if I remove this comment, I will actually get a printout after every execution of the current value of i, current value of j, and current value of sum. These are called debugging outputs, meaning when I am executing the program and my program is not getting me final results correctly, I would like to examine what is happening inside. This is almost like executing the program manually, which we did for question one. That is not possible for most complex algorithm. So typically while testing your programs, you would like to add such output statements. Once you have corrected the program, there is no need for them. But in general, instead of removing them, if I put a slash slash here, that means this line becomes a comment. It will not be executed. However, it will be available if later on I want to modify my program and again go back to this test. There are better methods of doing this, which we shall discuss later when we discuss the uh, debuggers which are available for uh, C++. This is the crux of this. If sum is equal to given value, then I have found a subsequence. That subsequence started with SI, the starting I. The end I, EI, is clearly the current J. So I have now SI and EI, which is my subsequence. And for good measure, I write here elements are, for K equal to SI to EI, I will actually print all those elements. So I'm not only outputting the start point and end point, but I'm also outputting the elements in between just to see that yes, they do add up to the given value. This break statement is to ensure that if sum is equal to given value, I do not unnecessarily go back to the next iteration. It is not necessary. Break will get you out of the innermost loop, whether it is a for iteration or while iteration. In this case, it is a while iteration, so you will get out of that. At the end of this, of course, before going to the next iteration, 
I set J to J plus plus so that I look at the next element. Observe that. Let's go back to the previous slide. Observe that this iteration, which is while J less than N and some less than given value, can also be written in terms of for J starting with SI or I and going up to N with some additional conditions for breaking. That is what I have written in another version called version 1. I will upload both these versions and I'll urge you to think more about it. And as our friend there was suggesting, you could have additional different mechanisms, perhaps cleaner, perhaps more elegant mechanisms to do exactly the same thing. Thank you so much.